2017, the same year that you became a school, uh, we arrived on campus. So how uh, 2007. Thank you, Mary. Thank you <laughs> for fake news. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, with 2007. 10 years ago. So, uh, Howie's done an amazing job. Uh, he's been amazing. How we, uh, we have a family connection, right? So <laughs> my daughter married Harry's son. And we, <laughs> we share three beautiful grandchildren. We do. <laughs> so, so I had a close connection to Somos before I arrived here, a, a familial <laughs> connection. Can I just say a word, a personal word, before I talk about what you see on the screen? So as Malcolm said, I was a journalist for 35 years, and I was a reporter and editor. I was the editor of Newsday. And when I arrived here, one of the joys that I found here were finding kindred souls, people at the university who were as passionate as I was about serving the public interest, making a difference in the world, helping societies and people. And I found the people in Somos to be the most kindred of those spirits almost immediately. And they gave me great aid and comfort and encouragement for what I was doing. And so people like Malcolm and Carl Safina and others early on became really very much collaborators and colleagues and supporters and creative people who understood the power of journalism and the importance of helping the world become better, which is what journalism is supposed to do at its best. And those, those connections became very important, and they continued. They continued so that um, when we started the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science in the journalism school, and you'll hear more about that soon, Christine O'Connell, who's here to talk to you about it, I'm very proud to tell you, is a professor in the School of Journalism. Our journalism students have done many projects here reporting on what's happening in SOMAS. Chris Gobler's work on Long Island reported widely by our journalism students. And I can tell you about our most recent collaboration which is that we offer a course in the journalism school teaching SOMA students how to deliver the weather on television. Now that's an interdisciplinary program. And I'm very happy to tell you that the first SOMA student, Andrew Salmon, who graduated in 2017, is now the weather person in Meridian, Mississippi. <laughs> okay? <laughs> on channel four. And he was on 15 hours straight during the recent storm. So it proves we can really do collaboration together. And I worked very closely with Mingwa and Larry uh, in collaborating with them. And I want to thank them for everything they've done. And I want to congratulate you for what you've done in 50 years. It has been amazing. I can say it as somebody who's not in the school, so I'm not self-interested. But when I look at what you've accomplished, it's been tremendous. And you should be very proud. You really should be very proud. Now, having said this, we're here to talk about communication. We're here to talk about how do you get your message out to the public about what you do, why it's important, why science matters, why the environment is important, 
And uh, I would normally say the 600 pound gorilla in the room, but I'm gonna say the 60,000 pound humpback whale. Am I right? <laughs> I'm never quite sure about these whales, I apologize, but that's the 60,000 pound humpback whale in the room. It doesn't matter how good you are if the public is not gonna believe you. If there are obstacles out there that are gonna make it almost impossible for you to deliver the kind of message that you want to deliver, the information you want to deliver. And so, you know, these two words encapsulate what's been going on here in the last year, but really what's been unfolding in the last decade. We are living through the most profound communications revolution in, since 1450, right? It's more than 500 years since Gutenberg. It's profound, these changes. And what I want to talk to you about in the next few minutes is what you might be able to do as citizens, as news consumers, as parents, and as grandparents to deal with this issue. It has a big impact on science, but it has a huge impact on citizenship in general and the health of civil societies here in, in America and around the world. And one of the things that happened when I came to the journalism school, I took a big detour. So I went out and I spent six months scouting for Shirley Kenny about what kind of journalism school we would establish at Stony Brook. What could we do that was different, that was special? And I focused on training the next generation of journalists who are more important than ever, and I took a major detour. And the major detour was my realization that it wouldn't be sufficient anymore in the 21st century for journalism schools to teach the journalists. If we did not take on a second mission that no other journalism school in the country was taking on, it would not be workable. And that second mission was training the audience. If the audience cannot understand and separate and identify what's reliable information from what's suspect, democracy won't survive, news media won't flourish. And so we set up a program called News Literacy to teach the next generation of students how to separate reliable information from junk, and we have taught that course to 10,000 undergraduates here at Stony Brook. It is spread to 30 other universities, and it's now being offered in some form in 10 countries, Poland, China, Vietnam, Israel, Australia, India, Japan. And we teach it here as a three credit, 42 hour course and I'm gonna teach you the whole thing in 20 minutes. <laughs> Even I can't speak that quickly. So my goal here is just to give you some highlights about why I think we are seeing this proliferation of fake news. I'll try to give you some very specific tips on what you can do to spot it, to fight it, and we'll see where we are. So here's the fake news invasion. If it looks like a science fiction movie, it really is. Science has always been an important part, really, of fake news, because fake news is not new. In 1835, the New York Sun reported, many of you may know this, that there was life on the moon. Life included uh, beavers that were larger than elephants. It included all kinds of stuff. They had illustrations of bat people. You're gonna hear a lot about bat people. It became a sensation. It was based on a report that the Edinburgh Journal of Science, John Herschel, famous scientist, had found this using a new telescope. And it went up and down the East Coast, circulation skyrocketed, you'll be shocked to know, during this period. And since it took six weeks to get a message across the ocean, nobody could disprove it for six weeks. <laughs> And of course, you know about Orson Welles, right? 1938, 79 years ago, the famous, the aliens have landed in Mill River, New Jersey. Oh my God. <laughs> now, if you had started at the very beginning of that radio broadcast, you would have heard a disclaimer. Either most people didn't hear the disclaimer or chose to ignore the disclaimer and panic, although if you look back, the panic was overstated in suit. What I want to point out to you is science becomes a lightning rod for a couple of reasons, and it's still a lightning rod. One is it plays into people's hopes and fears a lot. 
In the 1830s, you may or may not know, there was a great deal of speculation about life on what was called heavenly bodies. And lots of people wanted to believe it. And of course, we still have this idea that the aliens are coming at any minute. And so those kinds of fears and hopes play into this as much as possible. And we still have had fake news for a long time, right? <laughs> this bad shot. How many of you, did anybody see Carl Zimmer yesterday who was here to talk about science reporting in the era of fake news, you'll know that this Batman story got, this is a bat child by the way, half human, half bat, I know it sounds insane, got a lot of currency and stayed around a long time. But you know, we've had this for a long time, we all know it, we walk by those supermarket counters for years, you kind of stare at it, you laugh at it, you go on. So what's changed? What's going on? You know, and a lot's changed, a lot's changed. One, we are overwhelmed by this volume of information we're getting every day, right? It makes it harder and harder to know what's real. You know it yourself. And the great danger is when you get overloaded with anything, what do psychologists tell us? What happens when you get overloaded? You shut down. At a time you have to be more vigilant than ever, we're shutting down. Challenge number one. Challenge number two is this speed and accuracy. Journalism has always been had attention about speed and accuracy. When I started as a young reporter at Newsday, three different editors read every one of my stories. See that, Jerry? We were doing a good job. And <laughs> now everybody's rushing to get news out faster and faster and faster. And often accuracy suffers from that. The third thing is that we are up against human nature. We were always up against human nature, but now it's really clear. People prefer to believe what they want to believe. And it's hard for them to accept information that challenges their belief system. This is baked into our evolutionary history. In our course in news literacy, we work with college students to overcome that. It is very difficult. And of course, the most obvious thing that changes is the technology, right? We have now technology that not only gets things to you fast, but we can use tools to deceive very easily. And there are actors, lots of malevolent actors, and they're growing in number and sophistication who are seeking to disrupt what people believe and not believe. And they're doing it more and more. And they're industrializing it. They're weaponizing it. And these are the challenges we face. So here's, you know, I talk about technology. You'll appreciate that this is a shark that's uh, in, in, been in the freeway in Houston after Hurricane Harvey. And this shark picture of what it's like in downtown Houston is all over the internet. You'll be happy to know that that same photo has been used in storms for the last seven or eight years. Because it's totally fake. People believe it. They send it everywhere. Technology meet makes it easy. There is even a new technology that can put my words in Malcolm's mouth and make it look seamless. Seeing will not be believing. Hearing will not be hearing unless we develop the tools to deal with that, right? The way the ecosystem works. You remember during the election, there was a tweet that the president was being endorsed by the Pope. That tweet was retweeted 868,000 times. The Pope immediately, the Vatican immediately said, oh my God, that never happened. <laughs> And they put out a real tweet saying, not true. Look how many times that was tweeted. Who's winning in that war? Who's winning in that war? Columbia University and the National Institute of France did a study recently that found that six out of 10 people retweet without opening the link. All they see is the headline attached, the headline. Here's a headline. How do you like this headline, by the way? This is a real story. I love this headline. You know, if you like Oreos, wow, this is just great, right? Now, when you click on the story, it is a small new study, and it deals with just rats. So, Jerry, there's an example of a bad headline, okay? People will pass that story on because they just see the headline. Why does it matter? The other thing that's changing is people are acting, people are acting on this bad information. You know, you pass the National Enquirer stuff, the bad person, you know, you don't act on it. 
even if you want to believe it. People are acting out of it. You all know about Pizzagate, right? False report, Hillary Clinton and other uh, members of her uh, staff are running a pedophilia ring in the basement of a pizzeria in Washington, D.C. Absurd? Jim says absurd? Guy drives 250 miles with a rifle and a handgun to go in and rescue the kids. We laugh. Think of the potential consequences. Recently, the defense minister of Pakistan threatened nuclear retaliation against Israel for a false report that Israel was very upset and was threatening Pakistan. And he took it seriously. I just want you to think about the consequences about what's going on. During the election, if you look at the last three months in the election on Facebook, Larry mentioned Facebook. If you look at the election study done, you will see that in terms of the 20 most popular stories, the stories that were engaged, retweeted, shared, read, the lines crossed here, and more people engage with fabricated stories than with real news stories. Oh my God. Think of those consequences. What's the answer? The answer is not going to be technology. You know, one of the things that gives us, I think, some false comfort is these technology companies, Google and Facebook, are so sophisticated, they are so good, you know, that they unintentionally, because I don't think they intended the consequences to be like this, they'll figure out a way to help. They'll figure out the perfect algorithm that will be able to tell you, don't believe this. And they're working, as you know, on lots of things to try to help. But it's not going to solve the problem. It can solve the problem. What happened in Las Vegas is that there was a report that started on a right-wing blog or 4chan, which is a message board. It got into the ecosystem. It got into the algorithm. And it became one of the top stories on Google search. Even though it was terrible, totally fake. Not only was it totally fake, that the shooter was a Democrat and loved Rachel Maddow, and you understand why that's so disruptive. They ran a photo of the person. All fake. Fake, 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 and it was right up there in the ecosystem, shared over and over again. How do we deal with this? What's the answer? And it's bigger than fabricated news. It's not just made up stuff. It's stuff that's half true. It's stuff that's misleading. It's stuff that's deceptive, but has a germ of truth. Stanford University last spring did the biggest study ever done so far of the ability of college students and high school students in America to spot false or misleading information online. This was the premise. This is the digital native generation. These are the kids who are growing up with smartphones, right? Right in their hand. They have enormous screen stamina, right? If any of you have children or grandchildren, you know. It's, the stamina is just unbelievable. They have great facility, you know. They can use any device to do anything. How smart were they? So they did a study and they devised a series of exercises to give to these students. One of the exercises, for example, was they sent high school students to the Atlantic website to look about science and energy policy. And they gave them two stories. This is, these are the two stories. And they said, look at these two stories and tell us which one you would use to get reliable information about America's energy supply. One is a story by a very good science journalist, and the other was sponsored content by Shell Oil. Everybody knows what sponsored content is? One of the real more insidious kinds of information forms, although news organizations are relying on this content more and more for revenue because their model is so broken. Okay? And this story, by the way, said it was sponsored content right here, sponsored content Shell Oil. What do you think happened? These are some of the smart kids, high school students, representative across the country. Anybody want to guess numbers? What they decided? Anybody? 70% chose the Shell Oil. 70%.
And when they were asked why, they said they had more data. More data. Not even thinking about where the data came from. It didn't matter. Nice chart, life data, that must be true. This is what we are up against. What you're up against, I'm up against, both in what we're teaching and in our own personal lives. So as I said to you, the response really is news literacy. We have to teach the audience to be smarter. Technology companies won't save us, and I have to say that no matter how good journalism organizations get and they have to get better, they won't totally save us. We have to learn how to be much smarter and be our own editors and our own filters, and it has to become second nature. I'm giving you this as just tips. I hate tips. You know, in the Alan Alder Center, Alan Alder would always say, if you were going to go play piano at Carnegie Hall this Saturday, I wouldn't give you a couple of tips on Thursday. <laughs> but I am going to give you some tips, and I'm leaving behind something that two things that will help you, a story on how you can learn specifically. So there are some obvious things. As scientists especially, you obviously can apply your critical thinking to always asking, what's the evidence? Does the story support the headline? Who? There are fact-checking websites. There's technology that can help. If you don't want to know about that shark, that shark photo, you get a photo that looks too good to be true, you can go to tineye.com and they, in fact, will check out that photo for you. There are fact-checking sites and Snopes. If there's anything you're not sure of, it's one click and you can go someplace else. Be very aware, and I'm going to tell you this for you, because one of the biggest problems here is not just with people that you and I might think are just not smart or, or not willing to believe this or they have political biases. Hubris gets in the way. We think we're really smart and we can't get fooled, right? And we get fooled. Smart people can get fooled. And one of the things you've got to be careful about is when you get stories that are sent to you from other people. And when you get emails from other people, who's the most dangerous person I tell the students to get an email from? Who's the most dangerous person they can get an email from? Their mothers. <laughs> For lots of reasons. But, but you know my point here. When you get something from somebody you trust, when you get something from a colleague in Somos, you're going to believe it. You're going to say, this must be real. It's not always the case. Not always the case. You drop your critical thinking. People, our students, fall into some traps. They confuse the sender of the information with the reliability of the information. And very smart people can fall into that trap well-meaning people and you can get information about the environment and climate change and you're so eager and you're so anxious to help the cause that you pass it on. Paul Krugman who won the Nobel Prize uh, and is at the um, New York Times, if you were at the lecture yesterday, heard you heard that he passed on an incorrect tweet about a cholera outbreak in Puerto Rico and in part he wanted to believe it because he felt the president wasn't doing enough and it was false and fake. And it's come back to hurt him, the New York Times, and lots of people. We can get fooled. So don't confuse rank with reliability, we tell our students. And when you search on Google, I mean, we've become Google obsessed, right? Our students, boom. Studies have shown college students click on the top thing that they get on the Google search. They often don't go beyond that. So if you Google Martin Luther King, you're going to get a site called martinlutherking.org and it comes up third or fourth in the search. Anybody know who runs the site? Anybody? Try the KKK. Oh my God, what do you mean the KKK? And they, it's Stormfront, right? A white supremacist organization. And it looks real. During the election, there was a site called abc.news.co. So one of the things you've got to be really careful for are these mirrored websites that look exactly like real websites. So you've got to train yourself to look at that URL. Because that was a fake site, totally fake. And it looked like ABC News. What does .org mean? Anybody? 
What does .org mean? Anybody? How important? Nonprofit.com? Nothing. .org means nothing. .com means nothing. I can be a .org. I can be a .com. I can't be an EDU and I can't be a GOV, which is for government, but I can be anything else. It's meaningless. So if you get an email that Congress is about to do something outrageous and you need to sign this petition and send it to everybody in the world and they send you to a link and it's not a government link, it's a bill that comes up on a .org or .com, you'd be really suspicious. You've got, you've got to be dynamically attentive and your kids and grandkids have to be dynamically attentive to the information and you have to interrogate it like you would be a scientist. And I know this sounds hard, oh my God, I'm going to have to stop every story. No, it's got to be second nature. The real goal for me is not only to teach students at Stony Brook, because I think that's, a late, that's, that's really late in their careers to have to do this. They come with already a lot of bad habits. They come with political baggage. It has to happen much earlier. We are working here with a lab school in Coney Island that's taken our material and is adapting it for 10 and 11 and 12 year olds. And every student in this school, IS303, gets one hour of training in news literacy education every week for three years. You know, when I was, date myself here, when I was about 10 or 11, I think, I was called into the gymnasium at my elementary school and I lined up and I got a sock shot, the polio vaccine. I was part of that group. We need every 12-year-old in America to be vaccinated with these kinds of skills and values before they leave middle school if we are going to have a chance to combat all of the other changes that are hitting us. By the way, SOMAS is playing its part, and I'm very proud of that. This was a story that SOMAS had on its website. I don't know if you saw this, that you have developed a new program along with CAS. It's a new radar system that not only will be able to evaluate the weather, but control minds, okay? <laughs> the year before, you had a story as well about a new miner that you're offering in Sharknado studies, okay? <laughs> So you may or may not know this. Malcolm left this out of his slide. One of the highlights in SOMAS is your April 1st announcement of some fake news. Actually, Newsday the year before picked this up, but they, they picked it up as a joke. So they said that SOMAS was doing a joke. So you're, you're doing your part. And there was the story. Um, we have a course online. It's a MOOC on Coursera. That's a version of our course. It's not perfect. It's in English, Spanish, Chinese, Polish. I'm leaving behind a link to where if you or any people in your family, you can go on, it's free, you can go in and out. It's not the same as a person-to-person -person course, but it is a way of you getting caught up very specifically on what you can do and how you can deal with this um, new situation. Okay, anyhow, that's it. I, I thank you very much, and again, I congratulate you so much on everything you've done. Thank you. Answer a few questions? Sure. We have a minute or two. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Right. So do you consider that a possibility? And if it is, what can be done to address that? I think that will be a possibility. It will be harder. I think people will try to come up with stuff. I think you have to begin to read and watch things horizontally. Let me tell you what I mean about that. We're linear readers and, and viewers. I get a video, I watch it all the way through, which is fine. I read a story all the way through. You're going to have to leave that video. This is what fact checkers do. They leave the video, they leave the story, and they try to check it elsewhere. That will be the real guard, because if you don't see that video elsewhere, or you're suspicious, it's that red flag 
you've got to leave the video. There's no way sometimes you're going to be able to look at that video just there. And students need to leave what they're reading when it's important, if they're not sure of it, and go elsewhere to try to see if they can get evidence that what they just read is accurate. So that's what we're going to have to learn to do. I don't know if that's helpful. Ellen. I, I'm not sure what we, we, I think you're going to hear from Christine O'Connell in a second at the Alder Center, who will tell you what scientists can do to be more effective. So I, I'm going to leave that to her. I think there are ways that scientists can do a better job, much better job of engaging and communicating with the public uh, and do it through a, a lots of techniques, including when people disagree with you, not getting argumentative by telling stories, by finding connections. Lots of techniques I think will help. But I think this is no one answer, Ellen, is going to solve this. Yes. Heidi, go ahead. Artificial intelligence, you know, I wish, and I, I, I know we're on schedule, I wish I could tell you that technology will always find a solution. You know, and I, I love technology. I have Alexa in my house. I talk to her all day. It's great. But <laughs> AI, I'm not sure, will ever totally replace human critical thinking. Okay? And I think as this gets more sophisticated, we've got to get much more sophisticated in what we're looking at. I just think that's inevitable. So I don't think AI is going to totally solve it. Sheldon. Uh, yeah. Right. So very interesting. Uh, I want to ask you a question about uh, one thing I rely upon is, uh, let's say, New York Times science reporters who really know their stuff. So you've got William Broad, you've got Sanger, uh, before you had Gina Colada, top level people. But when I look at the New York Times fact checking columns, which they now have regularly, especially uh, the last name begins with a Q, I don't remember the full name, but they're awful. Uh, I find them, in my opinion, I read the things and I just know they're missing all kinds of things. So I feel even the fact checkers at the at premier institutions don't know how to do deep research. Well, I'm going to short circuit this because we can talk for a long time. And by the way, you're all invited to come and audit our course, um, to do anything that you think would be helpful if you want to come by and do this. Journalism is not perfect. Fact checking is not perfect. The obvious thing as a scientist is, is, and you know this, if you see something, say something fast. This is an age in which we have to respond very quickly to information that's not authoritative. And if you see information about science or about anything in your field, you can't wait. We're in, we're in a world where you see those tweets going around the world. You've got to respond quickly and authoritatively as fast as you can. And last thing I'll tell you is that Pew Foundation just released a big study, and I really should distribute it to Larry, who could send it to everybody, on what the public, where the public gets its science and how it gets its science. About Only about a third of Americans regularly get science news. Most still get it from mainstream publications, but more and more are getting it from social media and other things. So we're going to have to not just rely on the New York Times if this is going to work. But I think I should probably send you that. It might be instructive for everybody yep. to pass. OK, one more question, and then I want to get Christine. Go ahead, yeah, Mary. I, I, I think your idea of educating the public is fantastic. Um, however, we have a problem right now that we have a rim of people around the outside, you know, the edges of the continent who believe one way, and the center of the country believes that everything that the elite uh, east, the coastal areas are saying is false. So how do you persuade people from the Rust Belt or whatever that we can tell them how to teach people about news literacy? Because I think they're, my personal reaction is they're going to guess that we're trying to brainwash them. Long answer that I can't give you now. There, are, there is an answer to that question, but let me just 
caution you about making your certain assumptions about whole parts of the population. One of the interesting things that Carl Zimmer pointed out was it's more complicated. So there's a tendency to think that people who don't know science or are not very smart about science, those are the people who don't get climate change and don't get evolution. And it's issue by issue. So in a study that was done of first in a science intelligence test, they found that people who from both parties who were very highly intelligent in science uh, still agreed on lots of issues and on climate change there was still a divide. Because to some of those people it wasn't ignorance about science, it was about feeling a sense of tribal loyalty, it was about their value system, it was about their identity, it wasn't about their science. That's a tough one. And we can talk about that and there are ways, but I caution you to just dig a little deeper when you start talking about whole groups of populations because it's really more complicated. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, Howie. Yes. You said we had to be careful of our sources. Yes. Can we believe you? <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs>